Bingo, we're back here on Friday the 14th. Sustainable Hawaii is the name of the show, and we're talking about sustainability. We're talking about whether sustainability is still possible. Uh, we're talking about that with uh, Eric Asadurian, uh, who's a fellow at World Watch on the mainland, and he came uh, at the suggestion of two, uh, uh, two uh, professors at the university to come and speak to a number of groups about his views of things. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you very much for having me. Nice to have you here. And we have somebody to introduce Eric, and that is uh, Travis Idle. Tra Travis is one of those two professors, um, and he's an associate professor of tropical forestry at UH Manoa. And your job, should you decide to accept, Travis, mm -hmm. is to introduce Eric to our audience. Sure, I'll do my best. So uh, I'm uh, not just a professor at University of Hawaii. I'm working with the Watata Lecture Committee this year. Uh, the Watata Lectures are an endowed lectureship out of actually Church of the Crossroads here in Honolulu. It's um, an en endowed by the Werfel family to focus on issues of peace, justice, and sustainability. So this year we brought in uh, Mr. Asadorian to talk to folks in Hawaii about this issue of sustainability, what it means globally, and hopefully what it means locally as well. So he um, had a talk last night at University of Hawaii focusing on education. He'll be speaking at Church of the Crossroads tomorrow, Saturday at 7 p.m on the provocative title, Is Sustainability Still Possible? And then he'll also be giving the homily on the Sunday service at Church of the Crossroads uh, on the 16th. So we're, we're glad to have him here. It's been um, stimulating and a good discussion so far. So uh, thank you for, very much for having us on the show. Oh, today. sure, Travis. We, we, we like this kind of discussion because we want to get all kinds of points of view. Um, Eric, can you tell us your background and how you got into this subject in the first place? Sure. I actually have a background in, in psychology and religious anthropology, and, and it was actually some studies in moral education and, and cross-cultural moral development that exposed me for the first time back as an undergraduate many years ago into this sustainability crisis. I mean, growing up in an American consumer culture, a lot of it's hidden from view, mm -hmm. but only when you step out and see kind of the rapid globalization and, and consumerization of the world w where I really saw it and, and redirected my academic career to, to focus on this looming sustainability crisis. Where are you based now in World Watch? Uh, World Watch is based in Washington, D.C., which is where I live as well. Mm -hmm. And so as a fellow, what do you do for them? So I've done a variety of things. I've actually directed now, uh, I guess, six uh, reports, books. We have an annual book called State of the World mm -hmm. and another one called uh, Vital Science. Yeah, ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, but, you know, it's, we try to grab some of the key topics that are that are facing us right so i've a lot of where i focus is on the consumer culture because mm -hmm. that is the root cause of the sustainability crisis uh, and so you know we've looked at topics of that nature sustainable uh, the 2013 report is on this question of is sustainability still possible and the new one that i'm working on the 2017 report is on earth education uh, rethinking education for a changing planet mm. uh, you know what has to change considering all these crazy changes that are coming yeah. uh, in the education that we're providing our children today education what's your website that people can uh, look up uh, worldwatch.org okay and it's a 501c3 it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. so you came uh, and you spoke last evening and you had a group discussion this morning and you'll have a You'll do the homily at uh, uh, Church of the Crossroads on Sunday, is it? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a, a keynote lecture, lecture to the Saturday lecture night. On Saturday, yes. Yeah. So they're really keeping you busy. They are. Do you any surfing yet? No, uh, I, but I hope to get to the beach this oh, afternoon. Good. I so. hope you do, yeah, yeah. Travis. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> point him in the right direction. <laughs> so let's talk about you know the two principal issues you mentioned: consumer, the, the, the advent of a sort of a consumer world. Mm. Uh, what is happening? Can you, can you tell us the sea change on that uh, over the period that you covered it? Yes, and it's not looking good. I mean, if you actually look at the projections, uh, we are a population now of 7.4 billion people. It's going up to 9.9 .9 billion people by 2050, barring some sort of massive epidemics that stabilize. But just the momentum of our, of our population growth is bringing us there. Uh, and, and projections, often celebrated rather than mourned, uh, of the growth of the consumer class are, are just as quick. I mean, another billion people will join the consumer class by 2025. And while that's good for business that's selling all these um, you know, unsustainable consumer products, long term it's going to drive us even faster toward the brink. 
Uh, and so, you know, whether we're talking about you just pick the product and there's growth in it, right? The, the growth of cars in, in India and China, disposable diapers, pet ownership, uh, meat consumption, refrigeration, all of these things are putting huge tolls on, on the Earth's systems, uh, even as it you know, provides these you know, consumer benefits uh, to, to the population. So we have to really rethink this whole consumer system uh, if we're going to get serious about sustainability. When you say consumer system and consumerism, what are you saying? We, we want consumer goods. We want unbridled access to consumer goods. If we see it in the advertising, uh, we want it, whether we can afford it or not. We always want it. We want to surround ourselves with the best and brightest consumer goods that we see on TV. Is that what it is? Well, it's, yes, there's a bigger culture that really pushes us to want it, right? So th is the default really that humans are unrelenting consumers, or is it because of the systems that we've been born into, the cultural system that really celebrates consumerism? Just look at advertising, right? $500 billion every year spent worldwide to tell us that we want these things. And this is not happening just to rational adults, but there's a lot of marketing towards children, and there's a lot of research that says that children can't distinguish between you know, media content and advertising until they're about eight years old. So we're from from ch from babyhood on, we're priming children to to covet or to want more and more stuff, and and that's just not a good idea. Ecologically speaking, even health wise, right? We have two thirds of Americans are now overweight or obese, and that's partly the uh, main reason is because of the consumer diet. Uh, so if we are pushing onto children. Uh, soda and f fast food and all these other things with the help of friendly clowns and and tiger cartoons right then you're going to have children who eat unhealthy especially when they also don't have access to, tr to traditional knowledge like how to cook how to f how to grow their own food and all of that and that's all repressed well it sounds like there's three elements in that I like your comment on it one element would be as you mentioned the PR world mm. And I bet if I asked you whether the PR world had expanded, you know, you said 500, was it? Billion. Billion mm -hmm. on PR in this country. And actually, that's just commercial advertising. Public relations is a much, much bigger much more. Thing. Yeah. But it's all part of the same continuum, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so if I asked you, you know, how much that has expanded in the past, say, 10 or 20 years, you would probably tell me it has expanded by multiples in the past 10 or 20 Absolutely years. Absolutely would. And therefore, it governs more of what we do. It tries to reach us, you know, where we live. With, with every kind of media that you can imagine, uh -huh. those guys are being paid to sell us stuff. Yeah, I mean, here's a perfect example. Uh, so I'm in the process of editing this new State of the World, and there's a chapter on commercialization of childhood, and there's a, a nice box in there about Pokemon Go, right? They're all the rage right now. And, and it seemed pretty harmless. People advocate that, oh, it's actually even getting children out, outside and, and playing in the parks, right? But, but the company that and produces Pokemon Go is already has already sold rights to have more Pokemon showing up in places like McDonald's, right? So that's actually a tool now to bring children into fast food joints and, and you know into to priming them to buy more stuff. So so really every vehicle, media vehicle, is being utilized, whether websites, apps. You know, YouTube videos, uh, or you know, more traditional uh, marketing. Even schools. Schools are are complicit now in having advertising, whether through th outlets like Channel One, which is a a school-based channel that actually is you know force-fed to children in schools and includes advertising. What do you mean force-fed? Uh, well, meaning that uh, many schools in the United States have agreements with Channel One. The Channel One gives them free. Uh, computers and TVs, but in exchange you have to show as a school uh, the the, sh the program, Channel One programming, and and 25% uh, of that it's programming. Insidious. Well, it's insidious because you know some of it's news, some of it's m fake news, right? About you know new trends of new new products or celebrities, and then there's advertising. So to have a sacred space like a school spoon feeding children advertising and not you know, critically debunking that, saying, yeah. hey, we shouldn't actually be watching yeah. this, or yeah. let's dest deconstruct this. That's really, again, priming children to be consumers. Part of that, if I can just comment, extend it a little bit, mm. part of that is the technology. 20 years ago, we didn't have the internet, or at least not in this form. 
We didn't have social media. We didn't have television to the extent we have it now. Um, so if I'm a PR person and I want to sell something, I have lots more media that I can use more effectively. Uh, to say nothing about all the research they have about exactly how you reach people psychologically mm -hmm. uh, and sell them stuff. And that, that has happened kind of at the same time, maybe part of the same process. And that, that's of even greater concern because then th that every stroke they do, every penny they spend, it's more effective all the time in reaching their, their target market. This is getting scary. Yeah, it is scary. I mean, there's a, there's a great documentary uh, by uh, Morgan Spurlock, who d did Fast Food Nation, uh, or uh, did uh, Super Size Me. But he looked at product placement uh, and actually even you know, kind of a meta joke in this, this documentary was he actually had product placements paying for this documentary. But he, at one stage in the, in the documentary, goes into a... Uh, a functional MRI machine to, to track his brain waves as he's watching the, the newest um, movie trailers, right? And so that's happening now, right? For the blockbuster movies, um, you, subjects are being exposed to the possible trailers, the, the final cuts, and seeing which one is most effective at priming them to really want to go watch that movie. It's scary. It, it is. And then when you take that one step further, and this goes to, um, you know, our world politically and our, our, well, our world in general, uh, you're not only selling widgets or, or ice cream, you're selling ideas. Mm. And you can sell ideas to millions and billions of people using the same techniques. In fact, it's part of the same profession, PR, um, you know, advertising, advertising an idea. And you can, and, and that's what ISIS is doing. ISIS is using the same techniques that it found uh, we're being used in our consumer society. Um, so you can, you know, you can be a demagogue and affect everyone. That's scary. And that's happening parallel or part of the process you're describing, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, just a, a real convergence of, of different tools that can drive us to be consumers and effectively make us consumers. That's actually some of the, the focus of my work is this idea of, of cultural transformation, right? But not in the direction of making us more into consumers, but the opposite, right? But I've leaned on and looked at consumerization as a, as a case study, in a sense. You know, whether, whatever product you look at, there is a lot more effective use in making us into loyal customers of those products. Uh, then, you know, the sustainability community isn't using those same strategies very effectively, right? Maybe it should, Travis. I'd Maybe take these same tools and turn it around, use it on your side of the equation. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, in some of the movements that have been most effective, you think about uh, Bill McKibben and 350.org, it was sort of building a community, but it was building a community of young people who could use these technologies and, and get the word out. And I think what's, uh, you're seeing some of the effects of that kind of in, in, in the opposite direction. I, you know, you look at the, what's happening in, in North Dakota with the pipeline protests, people coming from all around, uh, you know, that kind of um, utilizing those same tools and strategies to bring people together around an, an alternative narrative uh, is exciting. But, and, you know, there's nowhere near $500 billion being spent on those kind of efforts. So it's, you know, it's a David and Goliath battle for sure. Yeah, but, you know, you could, you could take those tools and put them in favor of the pipeline and then make it appear we're actually have all, all the people agree by using those tools that pipelines are good and the environment's not so important. And, and so what happened to our government here? Mm -hmm. What happened to our education system? We have to cover those points before the break. Um, what happened to education? You talk about these kids that are, what, less than eight years old and they really can't make their own determination. Uh, what's the countervailing power there? Uh, what's the, who's pushing back on that? Uh, they are vulnerable and yet there's nobody telling them, hey, you gotta use your own kepi here. You gotta think it through yourself. You can't just take all these ads and become objectified. Who's telling the kids? Speaking of David and Goliath, I mean, this is, this is a classic case where, I mean, the, the FCC has relinquished control of that. The, in the 80s, they stopped really regulating advertising very effectively. And so we have small groups like the Campaign for a Commercial-Free Childhood 
uh, that is trying uh, and you know has some successes now and again it's to try to stop the most insidious cases. Uh, Scholastic had a you know who who is really a prominent bookseller in the in the educational market uh, had a, a partnership with the coal uh, industry, selling giving these uh, coal educational. Uh, booklets in in schools that were completely lopsided. No mention of climate change. No mention of of the the mining problems and all of that. And and so, groups like the CCFC speak up and try to push against that and and did successfully stop Scholastic's partnership. But that's one small case, and they they're uh, you know a group of five or six people, and so they can only do so much. There really needs to be a, a heavier regulation over the commercialization of childhood but also then start pushing for a, a sustainability-centric educational model. Uh, and there are small e examples of that really happening. Um, the, the best examples, I think, you know, Finland is always celebrated for its, its focus on, on good ele elementary school education. And part of that is because they don't really prioritize academics in those early years. Uh, it's a very play-centric model. Um, you know, Alpha, the reading is not even taught until six or seven years old. Uh, and, and that's a real different model than the United States, really. It's about focusing on socio-emotional learning and, and the basics of being a good human early on. And, and there are neat kind of pathways to even bring that even further, right? The, the forest school movement uh, is, a, is a really exciting one where the ch kids today, um, a thousand schools in Germany, over a hundred in Scandinavia, are, are going to the forest for their first two years of education. Mm. Uh, they, they're not going into a classroom, nothing. They just go out into the woods, whether it's raining, snowing, really hot. Outward bound. Um, yeah, outward bound, but, but 200 days a year uh, in, in all different climates and, and really focusing about just connecting them to nature. Walden which, Pond. Yeah. Walden Pond without the, uh, the, the failure to grow peas, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a short break, gentlemen. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about how this affects our democracy. Uh, we're going to talk about whether democracy is, is suited to deal with these new factors that have arisen for, for us. And we'll talk about what we can do about it, e either in education or in government or in, I don't know, personal approach. I'm sure you have some ideas. We'll be right back after this short break. Hey, Stan, the Energy Man here. I know you're bored this summer. You're just sitting at home, figuring out what to do, go to the beach, spend some time with Think Tech Hawaii. Spend the time thinking about how you can contribute to Hawaii and making it a better place to live. And start watching some of the programs on Think Tech, including Stan, the Energy Man, where you'll learn all about everything energy, especially hydrogen and transportation. So we'll see you every Friday at 12 o'clock noon. Stan, the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. We're back, we're live, we're here again to wrestle with even more difficult questions. Eric Asadurian and Travis Idle are from UH and from World Watch. Very important discussion. Okay, so it sounds like to me that these new things that have popped up in our lifetime in the past 10, 20 years and have taken root, um, you know, based on fairly mean considerations like money, uh, there's, there's a mercenary quality to PR and to the way we you know, um, undermine the vulnerability, uh, 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 take opportunistic uh, approach on the vulnerability of our kids and consumers. Um, and this affects ultimately our thinking. This affects ultimately our democracy. It affects us where we vote, where we live, how we engage with our government. Our government is us and we are our government. However, <clears throat> we don't like our government. And we are disenchanted with our government. And we fight against our government. And the thing is screwed up. So question, where does government fit in all of this that you're describing? Uh, and, and is government a solution? 
government, when working well, is a, an essential solution. So my work, again, on transforming cultures, it, it breaks it down into how do we change culture intentionally. Uh, and and that, there are six institutions that are key. Business, education, government, the media, social movements, and traditions. Right? So government is one of those six key tools. Uh, and, and they can be pushing us to be consumers, or they can be pushing us to be uh, sustainability uh, you know, citizens. And, and what does that mean? I mean, there, there are so many different tools in the government's toolbox, but I think the one I really like to focus on most is choice editing, because it's happening all the time. What is that? So choice editing uh, is, is, a, is a fancy way of saying you know, the, all the different little nudges that happen without us even paying attention. Speed bumps on a, a road to, to calm traffic so we're not uh, you know, driving really fast because there's lots of pedestrian. That's a, a very subtle choice edit. Uh, there are many edits in the other direction, right? Uh, free on-street parking encourages us to drive, uh, but free buses or, or you know, buses that are effective, um, shared bicycles, all these things are, are effective ways to encourage us not to drive, right? So finding the ways to use government, you know, again, because it's such a broken system right now, you know, the nudges are actually probably going to be much more effective than banning of light bulbs, right? When mm -hmm. we tried to ban incandescent light bulbs, there was a stink that happens, right? You're taking away our freedom. But gentle nudges, in, in D.C., we had a, a five-cent plastic bag tax. And that was very effective at reducing plastic bag consumption. Uh, if we had tried to ban plastic bags, there would have probably been a very different reaction. So finding those ways to use government in ways that get through the opposition is, is one short-term uh, way to help you say use government, government. And, and indeed, I mean, I think it points out a problem. Mm -hmm. um, somebody has to come to government and say, no, you should do this. You should regulate this or not regulate that. Um, you should tune up the, the system and the, therefore the culture. But so often it doesn't come from government. It mm -hmm. comes from, you know, pressure groups. It comes from uh, organizations whose job it is to try to convince the government to do one thing or another. And sometimes those organizations are the very organizations, the very same entities that, that take advantage of kids. Mm -hmm. It's for a buck, yeah. is what it is. And um, you know, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't you rather see government come up with these solutions itself? The problem is the election cycle and the kind of thinking we have seen in the national campaigns lately, which is not, not thinking at all. Um, it's irrational, and the people who follow that are irrational. Um, how are we going to fix that? Because I, I, sub I submit, you can disagree, I submit we're not going to be able to fix it until we can make government rational and government sua sponte come up with its own solutions. Yes, that is true. I mean, we, we have a huge amount of lobbying dollars pushing us in the wrong direction. So an, an advocacy group based on values is probably not going to be able to out voice somebody in, on the other in, side of that in, same se question yeah, several industry groups that or are you have no guarantee there. that it will yeah you and they, two well, advocacy groups and you don't know which one is going to prevail right so it's it's a very broken system right between the lobbying between you know the corporate the campaign finance reform that's really made this about money to mm -hmm. get into citizens united uh, yeah exactly so how do we go through that and and there's no real good answer in the short term uh, i don't think uh, we really have to keep pushing for reform of of governance um, which is a whole kind of step before we can actually start solving the problems. And, and, and time is not on our side with that. I mean, no, the sustainability I, don't crisis. You, don't you agree that it's a crisis? Uh, which part? The, the campaign uh, or the way government is today? The whole thing. Well, yeah, the whole thing, sure. <laughs> if, you, if you have to put it that binary, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Travis, you've been quiet. What would you add to this? You know, I, I think uh, from the governance side, we've talked a little bit about this since Eric's been here, and I, I think building community is, a, is a, a way around that, a workaround. And the more we can devolve uh, decision-making or, or self, you know, encourage self-reliance for building community, I think is a way to get around that. And I think the more local governments who are much more directly connected to the citizens in the communities, I think is also a way to counter the national dysfunction maybe that we see, you know, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of groups like World Watch at, in Washington, D.C. at the national level, but I think building community at the local level, especially in Hawaii, can be very effective. Yeah, why do I feel this is core for your trip here? Is it building community at the local level? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the only when you have these integrated networks of change agents are you going to actually become effective enough to, to combat the, the groups or the lobbyists and, and the other working for the other future. So what do we do, Eric? Give us a pass. Huh. I, that is not for me to say for uh, the state of Hawaii. But, uh, you know, even just in the short time I've been here, I've had great conversations that referenced the, the Hawaii 2050 plan mm -hmm. and, and, and new efforts to really think about about Hawaii's future. And, and Hawaii is, is unique as far as the states go, as far as thinking about the self-reliance of this country, uh, this nation system or this state system, where if you really think about 2050, where the, you know, the global population is much higher, climate change is already probably up to 2.3 degrees Celsius uh, projection, uh, probably almost a meter of sea level rise by then, well, there are going to be massive changes looming. Uh, major refugee population shifts over, over the course of the world. And, and Hawaii is going to have to be more self-reliant. Right? You're going to have to be more focused on growing your own food, uh, which is scary at one level, but it's also a real opportunity to transform the economy away from this globalized system that puts a lot of pain on people and, and builds you know, a, a real level of community, a level of self-sufficiency, a level of pride that uh, food is being grown, that energy is being supplied locally, uh, and that Hawaii has shown a, a different path for the future. Well, see that um, camera over there? That's number one. Um, and we have lined up all the millennials in the state who are now all watching you. Can you give them some advice on how they get there? Uh, what should their mindset be? What should their action points be? Well, you're, you're talking to a guy who just for the last two years was trying to promote a reality television show, really aimed towards the millennials, okay, uh, called okay. Yard Farmers, right? And, and for me, the idea that uh, we're going to have a consumer economy uh, that's going to survive the, the life of the, the millennial generation is just unrealistic. Um, and yet, at the same time, right now, the fifth largest crop in America is the yard, the lawn. Uh, and and uh, 40 million acres of lawns are being squandered, you know, mowed, you know, all these petrochemicals and fertilizers and, and pesticides are being used to sustain green monocropped grass, grasses and, and not the smokable kind uh, for the millennials, maybe. Um, <laughs> but, but so if you could actually transform that massive amount of, of agricultural opportunity into livelihoods, into community-based farms, yep. it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the world. So right? that, I mean, that would be a priority right there, uh, well, because it, it has it, secondary effect on other it has, things. It has multiple secondary effects. Yep. I mean, it, one, it pulls millennials out of the unsustainable consumer economy. Yep. It takes these unsustainable suburban houses and actually brings a multi-generational. Multi-generational living has been proven over the over the centuries to be more resilient than, than this. That's true. That's the human condition. Yeah, that, we've always lived multi-generational until recently. So it became um, the nuclear family. Yeah, you know. and, and so if you actually, those two are just on, on resilience over the long term and, and sustainability benefits, but it also is dealing with the obesity epidemic as we're growing real healthy food again, um, community uh, so resilience, right, as, as global food chains break down in this, in this era of instability upcoming, if you're growing some of your own food locally, that's going to be key to, to sustain a level of, of, of um, you know, well-being for the community. Yeah. Now I understand why you brought Eric in. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, and I think that one of the important messages Eric brings is that we want to try to do this intentionally. Uh, we don't want to do it as a response to a crisis, and as we are talking this morning, um, uh, an analogous type of crisis happened in Cuba in the early 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed and all the subsidies uh, for fertilizers, for tractors, for diesel fuel collapsed. They found themselves having to grow their own food again for their own use. I mean, they were an export agriculture economy as well. And they were able to do it, but it was painful. Uh, but they built a community around that, not just food systems. And so we want we to be able to do that as an intentional action, not as a response to, to collapse. In order to do that, you've got to get the word out, so education is so important yeah. at every level, including small children. <laughs> Eric Asadurian, thank you so much for coming down. Travis Idol, thank you for arranging this. Uh, wish you well on your trip, and a good trip back. Thank you.